Started. I guess the first announcement is our former director is visiting. Everybody knows. Oh, well, we got lots of former directors. <laughs> yeah. they, they, they never <laughs> left. <laughs> 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 Uh, okay, tomorrow, ESPM Colloquium, Catherine Milton is speaking on differential effects of unusual climate stress on Puchin and howler monkey populations on Bar uh, Colorado Island in Panama. That's at 11 in Mulford. Uh, tomorrow at 1, Geo Lunch, uh, Brandon uh, Basso from 3D Robotics is speaking on closed loop farming. No idea. <laughs> The IB seminar tomorrow at 4, Laurel Larson uh, is speaking from uh, sediment aggregates to pattern landscapes, complexity, and emergence across scales and wetlands. That's tomorrow at 4. Uh, Friday at noon, the Wildlife Fisheries and Conservation Biology seminar. Sam Evans from Energy Biosciences is speaking. Land use change and biodiversity in agricultural landscapes an application to biofuels in the U.S. On Tuesday, Fossil Coffee, uh, Matt Kaplan from UC Santa Cruz is speaking. Or organism species and community responses to early Permian warming following the late Paleozoic Ice Age. And then finally, the East Bay Science Cafe is next Wednesday uh, at Ca Cafe Valparaiso in Albany. And Patricia Zambrisky from Plant Microbiology is speaking. Those are the upcoming seminars. Is it useful to, for me to read all the titles and everything every week like this? I assume people get this all by email. But no, no, we don't no. actually. You don't? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the tradition has been to read it all. And, yeah, okay, so I'll continue to do that. <laughs>
Every time I read fossil coffee, I think it's got to be just really stale. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other announcements? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, MCC grad students, um, we've compiled a really exciting list of nominees for our student invited speaker. If you haven't voted yet, please do that. Only about 50% of the MCC grad students have voted. If you have voted, thank you. Encourage your lab mates and their, their occupants. It is an exciting list. I've seen some of the speakers, so I, there, there are a few there that, you know, we'll, we'll look at the budget. Maybe we'll even pick the top two or something. So. Okay, any other announcements? Okay, uh, Dave is going to introduce uh, today's speaker. Um, before I introduce the speaker, I just want to uh, um, draw to everybody's attention. I think most of you know that we lost our former curator of herpetology, Bob Stevens, who died Monday morning at the age of uh, 98 years and six months. He had a very good run. Uh, and uh, while we mourn his loss, we really celebrate his extraordinary life. He was uh, he joined the museum faculty in 1945. Uh, he was active professionally until last year when he published his last book, although I understand there is still a manuscript of another book that might <laughs> see the light of the day. Um, he was uh, an active teacher. He was involved, involved in uh, education at the elementary and, and the intermediate levels, as well as at the university level. Uh, he was a prolific uh, writer of, of books, field guides especially, and very well known. Uh, his master work was the famous monograph on uh, the ring species on Satina, which has uh, been the source of ongoing research in the museum almost ever since, up to even the present time. Uh, and Bob was also a, a magnificent artist, uh, not only of scientific illustration, but of portraits and landscapes. And uh, the museum still has some of his uh, landscapes on display. Uh, so he's, he's really quite an extraordinary person. And above all, he was a conservationist who was very actively involved in conservation activities, uh, particularly in the American West. And his special love was the Mojave Desert. And he was very influential in getting the, uh, the National Park established. Uh, he worked directly with Diane Feinstein and then Senator Alan Cranston on that. And uh, so he, he, he really was a, a significant uh, person. And uh, I know his passion was human population control. And he felt that everything that was wrong with the Earth stemmed from overpopulation. And so it would be wrong to say to not recognize his passion in uh, remembering him. So uh, now I'd like to move to the introduction to Vance. Uh, Vance Friedenberg, <coughs> a graduate student here at Berkeley. He was sponsored by me and by Mary Power. And when he finished his PhD work on, uh, on mountain yellow white frogs, uh, he, he thought that he'd resolve the problem of why uh, frogs were declining in the Sierra Nevada. And he demonstrated conclusively the, um, um, the impact of fishes on frogs in the High Sierra. The fishes were introduced uh, many years ago, but the cumulative effect was just was late in being felt. And he thought that he'd resolved this issue, and he had a great paper published in PNAS demonstrating this, and it was a, an effective demonstration of the fact that they were declining because of fish. But then, uh, within the next two years, he began discovering more declines. And this is when he discovered that a second level, a second wave of disaster was hitting frogs in the Sierra Nevada. These were the once most common vertebrate in the Sierra Nevada. In Grinnell's time, it was the most common vertebrate in the Sierra Nevada. And, uh, um, he documented that uh, the kytrid fungus was up in the high Sierras and was wiping out. So that uh, 
between 95 and 98 percent of all populations, all, all recorded populations, have become extinct, down to the last of the last, and that's what he's been working on progressively in many ways. He did a postdoc with Craig and uh, Sherry Briggs following uh, that, act that activity. Uh, he was, he's, he's been very effective in raising funds for his research, even as a graduate student. And uh, then he was hired at San Francisco State University, where he is now an associate professor. And uh, he's been very productive. And today he's going to tell us uh, about the latest work that he's been doing on the decline of amphibians. Thank you, Dave. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, if someone could put the lights on. So um, I'm going to walk you through a bunch of the research I've been doing recently. And I, I just want to start out by saying this is the coolest frog in the world. And I'll, just fight anybody who wants to talk about it. But this photo was taken by Anand Varma, who was an undergraduate here uh, in the MBC, and he's now working for National Geographic. So I just want to uh, give you the big picture, of course, start with the big picture. Amphibians as a group are, are worse off than other vertebrates. It's been known for some time now. And of course, uh, David Wake was one of the sort of uh, pioneers in, in making the world understand you know, that we really do have a Unusual, unusual situation with our amphibians around the world. They've made it through um, mass extinction events. Here's a, a photo. I was there. I took it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you know, they're depending on how many mass extinction events there you want to call. If there have been, there've been multiple, okay, many, many of them, obviously. But amphibians seem to have done quite well. Um, so there are many people at first started talking about amphibians as sort of the canary in the coal mine, the most sensitive group of vertebrates. Um, and we argued in a not too recent paper, but a few years ago, we argued that actually they're actual survivors. And uh, that there's something going on today where they're much worse shaped today than they have been over, uh, over millennia. So, um, and I like, I like this. This is uh, from the New York Times. Um, you know, uh, you got to love the New York Times for making it really <coughs> simple. And just look at this. Hopefully, if you aren't red colorblind out uh, there, um, you can see that a large proportion of the amphibians that we know about are in trouble. And there are lots of different reasons for, for, for the uh, declines. And as Dave uh, uh, suggested, uh, I came face to face with one of those, which is the, the chytrid fungus, which I'll be talking about. Um, and I can't really talk about amphibian declines without talking about the fact that there are multiple things causing declines including, of course, habitat destruction. Um, but you know, just putting habitat aside and protecting it is not enough to, um, to save what's, the, what's left of the amphibians. Um, if you look globally at where amphibians have declined, if you look at the percentage, for example, of red-listed amphibian species in these color boxes in these different biomes around the world, you can see that some parts of the world are in really, really bad shape in terms of the uh, amphibian fauna, especially Central America and in the Andean highlands, uh, parts of Sri Lanka, Japan, uh, even parts of Asia, and of course um, Australia, where a lot of the uh, first declines were talked about. The poster child species, really, for amphibian declines is this one, Bufo peregrinis. These were uh, the last living individuals for the species in Costa Rica were seen in 1989. Uh, but, you know, California is actually, people don't really realize it, but it's a, it's a real hotbed for amphibian declines in the sense that we were also a place where some of the first amphibian decline papers came out, or data came out of California. This is from David Bradford, who I believe was a graduate, undergraduate here, or a master's degree. Yeah, okay. that's right. He got his master's degree here, and um, and he publishes papers about as fast as I do. Here's a paper showing data from 1979 but it was published in 1991. <laughs> so, so those of you grad students, you know, just hang on to that data. <laughs> uh, but this is showing mountain yellow-legged frogs uh, in Sequoia National Park, uh, the number of live frogs that crashed in August of 1979. And this is just um, showing the um, number of dead animals found. Unfortunately, um, he went to Australia and while he was gone, um, I, someone found his dead frogs in a jar, in a bunch of jars in UCLA, and they were doing a cleanup, and they all got um, lost. So we're not able to go back and look at these individuals to see if they died of Catrigia mycosis, no fault of his own. Things happen. Um, but let's just talk about this disease then. So the disease is called Catrigia mycosis. The fungus, the pathogen is called Patricocatrium dendrobotitis, so called BD. 
Uh, and uh, here's a, a scanned electron uh, photograph of the um, zoospores that are, that are called encysting in the skin of the frog. And um, this, is just, oops, this is just showing you the etymology of the name. It was first discovered in uh, dendrobatid frogs. Uh, and here's sort of the life cycle, the generalized life cycle, where you have these motile zoospores down here that swim through the water or through a film of water, uh, insist and infect the skin of the frogs, cause, a, uh, you got uh, asexual reproduction that uh, basically creates many, many more of these zoospores. And uh, in many species, or at least in the most susceptible species, in about two weeks you can get mortality um, occurring mostly in adults. And um, uh, just here's a, here's a video that one of my grad students took recently. And you can see all little zoospores swimming around. Um, it's a pretty fantastic story that I never would have believed when I started graduate school. But here it is, uh, proof positive that these are the little uh, beasties that are swimming around and affecting our amphibians. Um, uh, this and a, another couple of videos like this are going to be on the floor of the California Academy of Sciences in the, one of their new biodiversity exhibits um, in the coming years. So uh, we have a really great uh, detection method that we use, which is a real-time quantitative PCR assay that allows us to swab frogs without harming them. Um, and then we can go back and analyze the data and, and figure out, because it's microscopic, we can figure out how infected an animal is and also estimate, for example, how many zoospores are being produced by that animal. So um, it kills, and this is sort of the the last of the technical slides of how it works in the sense that it kills frogs, we believe, by causing epidermal dysfunction. And Jamie Voyles has given a talk in, in this venue before. Uh, was a, she was a postdoc here um, last year. Um, and we've shown that the lab, um, the lab papers that look at sort of how amphibians are killed by the fungus match actually with field data that we collected, a bunch of field data on frogs that were dying in the field and showed that um, this this sort of seems to hold uh, across different species. So it causes complete dysfunction of the skin, and of course the skin is super important for amphibians. Um, and there is, I don't know if you know it, but there's a fear of fungi these days. This is a, a <laughs> paper that came out a couple of, uh, last year, sorry, um, with uh, Sherry Briggs and a bunch of other folks, a review paper, where they talked about not only uh, the fear of fungi uh, in terms of emerging pathogens threatening vertebrates in the wild, but also affecting food security. So it's a much bigger um, issue than just amphibians. Here are some pathogens that are emerging that are fungal in nature uh, that affect humans, animals, and plants. And uh, sudden oak death, by the way, is not a fungal pathogen that is believed to be at first. But you can see that there, there is a lot of interest now in understanding why suddenly we're seeing, for example, uh, increases in valley fever in humans. Um, it's very unusual. If you look at, for example, the number of pathogens that affect humans, uh, almost all of them are either viral or bacterial. Um, very few of them are fungal. And yet, we seem to be get seen, or at least, especially in wildlife, we seem to be seeing an emergence <coughs> in uh, fungal pathogens that are affecting them. And this is, um, this is a very recent <coughs> complicated map by uh, Bat Conservation International showing the emergence from New York State and spread from 2006 uh, through 2013, I believe, of the uh, what was called white nose uh, syndrome in bats, and it's an introduced <laughs> fungal pathogen that's killing bats by the millions. Um, so that's uh, so this is something where we're trying to uh, I'm sort of trying to get a point get get the point across that this fungal pathogen that I'll be talking about today is one that's affecting uh, mostly amphibians, and we're lucky that it's mostly affecting amphibians, not, not these kinds, not, not mammals. But, um, but it's an opportunity, really, to understand what's going on in these systems and why is it so out of control uh, in the sense of um, the effects that it's having. So um, I'm going to show you a series of slides that sort of gets through you know, how is BD working, um, how is it <coughs> spreading, there's a, there have only been a few papers actually where people have actually been lucky enough or unlucky enough to catch the spread of the pathogen through uh, wild populations of amphibians. And one of the studies was in, in the Sierra Nevada, California. And I've shown many of you these slides before, so I'm going to go through that relatively rapidly. But this is a study area in Kings Canyon National Park that I've been working on since I started my graduate career in, I think that was 1996 or 5, I can't even remember. 
<laughs> long time ago. 1995. 1995. Goodness gracious. So, um, <laughs> that you remove the fish out of these lakes that weren't there originally, the frogs come back, and then suddenly this pathogen showed up in 2004. And I'll be showing you data, um, just briefly showing you what happens when the pathogen spread um, through this system here and gave me uh, these kind of uh, results. So this is what that basin looks like, all these green, map, green lakes, uh, these are all draining to the north. Green lakes have frogs in them. Yellow lakes have frogs that get infected. Uh, black lakes um, are showing the uh, extirpation of those frog populations. So this is 2004, um, 2005, and it spread strangely all the way across the basin. 2006, 2007, 2008. So by 2008, it took actually four years to spread just a couple of kilometers across this basin, which is really unusual, uh, really uh, interesting and unusual in the sense that it also spread upstream. So it's an aquatic fungal pathogen, but it's not spreading downstream in the water. So it's actually spreading, we think, through contact, in this case, at this scale, from amphibians spreading into other amphibians. <coughs> These, this is the um, what happened to the yellow-legged frogs here, not yellow-legged frogs. But what I'm not showing you is work that another one of my uh, one of my graduate students did on Pseudacarus regilla, which are the Pacific tree frogs or coarse frogs that live in the same place, are affected by BD, but not as negatively, and their numbers have actually increased since their competitors have been wiped out. So. Um, a lot of information on this slide, but what I want to get across is that if you go to the Sierra Nevada and you look at our different species of mountain yellow-legged frogs and populations, there's two different species, um, and you look at the populations that were left as of um, about, these are the populations that were left as of 1996. As Dave said, there's been a 98 to 99% decline since then. Um, but you can find populations, very small ones, and very few of them, for example, in Yosemite National Park, that are infected with the chytrid fungus and are no longer declining. Um, and then you have so, sort of the persistent or the endemic phase of the, of the host pathogen dynamics. And then down here we have a situation, uh, six lake basins around here. Uh, we've been showing the situation where we have the epidemic version of that, which is basically the fungus showing up where it wasn't before and causing these mass dying. And of course, what we're interested in understanding is, um, you know, how do we get from here to here? How do we, how do we um, predict which populations are going to survive and why? And of course, the host microbiome is one of the things I want to talk about. Um, and this, uh, that was in the Sierra Nevada, but if you start looking globally, there's um, really, uh, you know, not a huge amount of predictions that we can make based on, for example, uh, relationships among species. Some are not susceptible, very closely, closely related ones are highly susceptible. Um, we have um, some animals like the American bullfrog, Rana casebiana, that's a carrier, and <coughs> other animals like this one from Australia that you know, die super quickly. So what's going on? How are we getting these differences? Well, one of the things that this paper from the Sierra Nevada helped us understand is that we were able to show that there seemed to be a mortality threshold. Um, where if you look at these different population trajectories, each one of these lines is one of those populations of frogs that got infected. Um, and at day zero is when the population started declining. So they get infected sometimes 300 days before they start declining. Uh, but they don't start declining until their infection intensities, as measured from our quantitative PCR, get really, really high. Okay, so here's, uh, uh, and, and sorry, and if you go to some of those populations in the northern Sierra Nevada, where they're not declining, their infection intensities look kind of like this, where they're, lots of animals are infected, but they stay well below the mortality threshold. So of course the big question is, is why do we get these spikes in some and not in others? And we've done trials in the lab, and we've shown that even for salamanders, there's some species that when they get infected, they die when they get at or near this, uh, this mortality threshold. Um, so, so this is really important because it gives us some measure of you know, what we want to do in science, of course, which is prediction. We want to be able to predict. When can we say something about it? So this, uh, this has been shown by um, several different authors out there. They named it a funny name, but we won't talk about that. Um, so let's move on to like, okay, now we got some prediction. But one thing I haven't mentioned is, okay, so the declines, the major declines in amphibians happened mostly uh, in the 1980s. Um, 
the um, fungal pathogen that I've been talking about wasn't described until 1999 by science. Okay, so there's a big issue here of mismatch. Okay, so there have been all these declines. I happen to catch it in the Sierra Nevada, but most of these places where amphibians declined, um, it was long after we knew what was going on with it. We even knew about the fungus at all. Okay, so now we know about the fungus. We've been lucky enough now to um, be able to go back through museum collections, and this represents uh, this data <coughs> represents work. These two earliest dates for uh, museum infected animals comes from histological data, where people have actually gone in histologically, taken skin samples, and looked through these animals. And the oldest uh, right now infected animal in the world is one from South Africa, an African clawed frog. One of the one of the clawed frogs that doesn't die with the infection. Um, the problem with histology, if anyone does histology, is that it takes a horrendous amount of time and labor to do it. Um, so there were limited studies uh, that people had used to look at histology in terms of uh, getting to these uh, collections, getting through these collections. In addition, museum curators don't really like it when you chop up the, the skin of your specimen and you never get it back, right? So we were able to, um, my graduate student, Tina Chang, was able to figure out a way to use our qPCR assay but on museum specimens. And, and it worked relatively well, about 80% of the time, 80 to 90% of the time it was really effective at that. And so what I'm going to try to do is get at these two questions with this technique, which is going through literally thousands of museum specimens from different parts of the globe and talk about trying to figure out when did BD get here and what does it actually mean? Um, did we get emergence in different places, or has it been there the whole time? Um, California uh, is the first place I'll talk about. Um, but before I go too far, you know, where did it come from? How did it emerge? There's, there's different ideas about how uh, you know, the pathogen could have been spread to different parts of the world. One, of course, is that these, the pathogen got spread into new places um, by being on some of these species that don't die that are carriers of the disease. And one of them is Xenopus labus, um, a amphibian species that's been used in science labs since the days of Darwin. Um, they, uh, there's actually a colonial, uh, uh, sorry, a British colonial story that led to Xenopus labus being used in labs in, in, um, in Great Britain for, uh, you know, for over a century now. And uh, they were brought from South Africa. They're relatively easy to keep alive in the lab. They're used for lots of different types of uh, biological studies, comparative work, early comparative work, uh, and they're still used today. There's someone down the hall from me who uses Xenobus um, to uh, look at cell growth and um, other things. The Harlan lab here had Xenobus all over the place. But one thing that um, happened in the 1940s, uh, sorry, beginning in the 1930s, is that people, hospitals, started using this species to test for human pregnancies. So you could inject some urine from a uh, person, in, from a woman, into a frog. They have the same hormones we do. If the person is infected, is infected. <laughs> 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 too bad Andrea isn't here. We're, we're having a baby in, in about a month and a half. <laughs> um, so if the person is pregnant, uh, then the frog ovulates, and you know the person is pregnant. Um, I was just telling the story to Dave earlier today. I was, uh, when we published this paper, we went back and looked at museum specimens from Xenopus here in California, found some positives um, in the wild. Uh, I was telling a reporter about this called the frog test, and I was laughing, like, yeah, way back when they used to do this test and to see if you were pregnant. And my mom was visiting, and after I hung out, my mom was like, my mom said, Vance, I did the frog test on you. <laughs> they used it until about 1973. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, frog test, positive. Uh, well, after we uh, developed better techniques for testing for pregnancy, those frogs were in many cases released. Um, so, let's, let's take a look at this. Uh, here is San Francisco, the foggy part of the world. Oh, God, it's so foggy over there. But we actually have. Uh, um, Xenopus populations today in, in uh, Golden Gate Park. We have Rana, uh, Kate's Biana populations down here right by SF State. Um, so what's going on with these populations? Are they a possibility for moving the pathogen around? Um, anybody ever had frog legs in a restaurant? Um, here's a farm um, in Asia showing Rana, Kate's Biana being raised by the tens of thousands. These are pens. 
And you can imagine um, there's probably some possibility, a pretty high one, that some of these guys can escape. So these are species native to eastern North America, and they are now um, found um, all over the world. Here's a, a map made by uh, Michael Lanou a few, uh, over a decade ago um, that shows that these bullfrogs are all over the place. And they're mostly all over the place. It has to do with uh, cheap labor. Okay, so you can raise American bullfrogs really easily, um, and you can raise them really cheaply in other parts of the world where labor is much cheaper. Um, so this is, you know, we're looking for how, for, for patterns of how did this stuff get around in the different parts of the world. Uh, this is a photograph uh, sent to me by my, one of my graduate students who's in China right now, Raul, and this is a market in Yunnan, China, showing, um, you know, that you've got live, in this case these are uh, Chinese bullfrogs, um, but they also have, um, that you can order up and eat right then and there, but they also have all kinds of, of reptiles and amphibians that you can buy for pets. Everybody loves to have pets, and so that's, the pet trade is another way that we're looking at how this pathogen may have spread around the world. So if we come back to California now and start thinking about, well, <clears throat> 1978 is when I showed you that David Bradford paper showed the mysterious decline of the frogs in the mountains. Uh, 1961 is the histology that showed the first positive in California, read by Stanford, by the way, Eagle Stanford. Um, <laughs> um, and if you look at museum collections for, these are Yosemite toads, and these are uh, Rana muscosa and Rana sieri. And I know these are hard to see, but hopefully you see the trend. This is 1910 by decade all the way to the, um, to the current decade. And you can see that there are um, uh, zero, zero, zeros, no BD positives from the um, swabbing technique that we did. An increase starting in the late 1960s. Um, and a peak around the 1990s for these guys. The 70 toads were the other species that declined in the 1970s in California. There was a big die off in 1978 right by uh, Toyota Pass in Yosemite, right outside of the Yosemite National Park. Um, and of course, we found a bunch of positives showing up uh, during that time. So this is prevalence on this side for this top graph in the bars, and then these little um, uh, things that went up here are the zoospore equivalents. Now these are showing you some idea of the infection intensities. So they're relatively low, but they're still increasing during the times when we have increasing prevalence. And here's the data from uh, yellow-legged frogs in the mountains. Um, a bunch of zeros. This gray line is the available sample size here in the MVZ. Um, and uh, after looking through, I think it was about 1,400. Most of the positives started showing up in 1974 uh, in the Sierra Nevada. And they peaked um, in about the, the 80s. Uh, by the time the 2000s came around, there were fewer animals being collected. But there's still quite, uh, quite um, high prevalence values for those. So here are two sensitive species uh, that are showing increases in the past. And so, again, we're trying to make the case of did this fungus have something to do with the major decline in the past of these two species? Um, looks like yes, uh, yes, and also in the present. Some of these are continuing. Um, but what about other species in California? Petrachyceps attenuatus. Great group of amphibians to work on if anybody wants to do museum work. They have something like 13,000. The train says, Dan, you guys have been busy here. Uh, that's just the attenuators. That's just the attenuators. Um, so if you, if you go through those samples, and you, these, these sample sizes are much larger than those silly frogs, and you can see that same thing. We get an emergence happening in the 60s, beginning of the 60s, and going into the, into the 90s. Um, the prevalence in these guys never goes, goes as high as it does in some of these other groups, which I'll show you when we get to Peru. And I think that has to do with the fact that they're not, they're just not as good a carrier. Uh, but one of the things we're looking at right now is trying to figure out why is Petrachyceps um, not such a great carrier of these things. And, and one of the things we're doing is trying to characterize the bacterial communities on these guys to see if those can help shield the, um, the, these animals from infections. Now, uh, Attenuatus and Gregarious, and other, some of the other um, Petrachyceps are communal egg layers. So they <coughs> actually hang out together a lot. And that can be bad in terms of spreading infection, but it can also be good because you can spread, spread um, symbionts that may be helping um, fend off this infection. Okay, so that's one of the things that we're looking at right now. We just got an NSF grant to work on these guys to try to understand what's the interplay between the, you know, the pros and cons of being uh, a social uh, vertebrate in this case. Um, if we start piecing together 
what's happened throughout Central America and South America in terms of these declines. Remember, BD wasn't described until after these declines happened. But um, Tina and Sean and others, uh, were, Tina was able to show that if we went back through these collections of amphibians at these mountaintops, where the animals, uh, where there were large declines before we knew anything about BD, um, BD tends to show up right before the declines happen in most of these sites, um, going all the way through <coughs> Central America. So BD, show, it's not there, it shows up, and then you get this massive collapse. I remember from that early map I showed, in many of these assemblages throughout uh, Central America, 100% or, or, or 80 to 100% of the species that are there um, have been affected, have, have declined. Um, so it's, it's pretty phenomenal. There was a paper published in 2008 uh, that proposed that a lot of the de declines in the Andes could have been due to BD, and this is just putting together a database on this group of frogs, of toads actually called Adelopus, about 100 species um, of this really, really cool group of toads, and about uh, 95 of them or so have disappeared since the 1980s. So what Karen Lips did is she went back through museum records and said, okay, well, when, when did these things decline? And, 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 um, and she found out that in uh, South America, the earliest declines happened in Colombia and in Venezuela. So she proposed that maybe those are the first two places where the fungus uh, arrived. And then she put together all these little places where people have been collecting and noticed declines and disappearances. And this is her sort of map of what had happened there. Well, now what we can do um, is we've gone back, and Karen's part of this. Uh, Alessandro talked about this when he was here. Um, if we start looking at those museum collections and now actually collecting disease data from them, from these swabs, this is what we've been able to amass for these two genera, or for these uh, groups of genera, the Telmetobius and the Adelopus. Um, we're, we're up to about 8,000 museum specimens from about 15 different museums. Um, and I'm not, I'm not um, hoping that you'll be able to just look at this and go, oh, there's the pattern. <laughs> but um, maybe if we look at it this way, uh, this would help. So here we are with our um, number of positives or the prevalence in all of those data through time. And you can see this fantastic increase uh, beginning, you know, beginning in the 1980s. So it's roughly correct um, that uh, if you just went through the museum records and said, when did they decline? Um, it's roughly correct in terms of the timing, and it turns out it's also associated with the increase in prevalence of infection of BD. And one thing I want you to notice, remember the prevalence I showed you from Petraxeps was up to around 12%? Here the prevalence goes all the way up to about 80%. And again, these numbers are very high. Um, I have a student, now many people ask me about these data and say, well, how does it work when you've got, um, you know, your PCR assay, how do you know if it, if it works far back in the past? Maybe all these negatives are just because, you know, your assay doesn't work very well in the past. Well, I have a, a grad student from Ecuador, uh, Andrea Manzano, who's doing work in Ecuador, and she has been swabbing animals from the um, early, uh, from the 80s all the way back to the 70s. And she's got, uh, beginning in 1973, she's got prevalences of around 80 to 100%, and infection intensities that are super high. So beginning in the mid-1970s, researchers in Colombia were collecting these amphibians that were highly infected and sure enough, you know, stopped finding them soon after that. Uh, so we know that at least back to the 1970s that, were, that our assay worked very well. Um, we also have some animals that we um, were able to do histology on, showed positives on histology going all the way back to about 1970. Um, and those guys, when they were positive from histology, 85% of them were positive on PCR. So, you know, we can't really test them too well far back in the past because there aren't very many positives, even from histology. Those 1934 specimens, we do get positives on them, but there's so few that we can't really do statistics <coughs> to say, yes, this thing works. Um, I also want you to notice there are a couple times where we get positives, um, sometimes well before these outbreaks happen. Those are, um, those are really interesting things. That so um, another thing we've been doing in, in terms of trying to understand this fungus is, okay, well, okay, which species are actually susceptible? And we can do susceptibility trials in the lab where we actually infect animals um, and see what happens to them under just really basic conditions. 
and we found some really interesting patterns. And this is uh, the Waikato Biological Station in Peru. Now, in Peru, the outbreak happened in the um, about over the last decade. By 2009, most of the frogs uh, that were declining had already disappeared, or, or mostly dis disappeared. And so we were working in sort of a post-decline landscape. And we wanted to know, okay, in that post-decline landscape, can we relax in terms of conservation? Even though most of the animals are infected out there, can we relax? So what we did is we did these susceptibility trials on a number of different species, including uh, a surviving but still highly affected Telmatobius, one of the ones that's very um, <coughs> susceptible to, uh, to declines. And then a, a suite of species that were available to us at this site from, um, from around uh, 500 meters up to 4,000 meters. Um, we bought the Telmatobius from the Telmatobius lady. Um, so these guys, just like American bullfrogs, they're sold in markets, and you can get a nice little liquado, a milkshake, of a fresh frog. They drop it right in. And it's really, really, I, no, I didn't try one, but if I had, I'd probably be having a son. Uh, in this, uh, um, that's why they drink them. Um, so they're traded all over in the Indies, and they're all super, super, super effective. 100% of these guys are effective. So we use those as our source of infection for the unknown frogs, for the other frogs. So we infected them. We looked at what happened through time. We had controls and infecteds. And this is what it looked like. Here's how we infected them. There's our infected Telmatobius, the uninfected frog on this side. Um, and then we just wanted to see what happened through time. Alessandro showed you some pictures of these guys dying, so I'm not going to do that. But what I'm going to show you now is a couple of the results from the study that showed that, for example, Telmatobius marmoratus, uh, which was also our source, is very, um, these are, I'm looking at two different things. This is percent survival. These are controls. And these are um, animals that are infected. The controls, in this case, were we tried to clear the infection from them. Um, we weren't totally successful, as you can see. Some of them just died. About 40% um, of them died anyway. Um, but the ones that had the full-blown infections died very, very quickly. And again, those full-blown infections tended to die uh, right when they were near that, uh, that mortality threshold that we talked about before, the predictive ability. The controls that survived, survived with very low um, infection um, intensities. That's what these are. These are the log values of this. So um, really interesting. Some species um, highly susceptible, but over longer periods of time. Uh, again, the ones that were dying in the infected tended to be dying with these really high levels of infection. The controls survived quite well. Um, some species weren't susceptible at all. Uh, this is a um, gladiator frog that, um, no, sorry, this is not a gladiator frog. Uh, this is a frog that is just highly, uh, uh, it can fight off the infection quite well um, and survive um, no matter what. Um, if you look at, what's interesting is if you look at the elevational range where most of the species are affected by BD in that part of the world, um, it turns out that, you know, if we just looked at it today, it says frogs along the elevation of gradients. Sort of if you just looked about at what was going on there today, you might suspect that, well, the susceptible species are all gone, but the, um, the ones that are left are probably going to be okay with BD. But it turns out that even the ones that are left, if you look at the susceptibility of those, um, there are a number of species that are actually um, still highly susceptible, at least during these lab trials. So one of the things that we're proposing is that we can't just necessarily assume that everything's going to be okay in a post-decline landscape. Um, some of the species that um, are, again, um, highly susceptible, what, one of the things we've done is we said, okay, well, let's look at the, um, the species that have survived the outbreak and say, well, what's, what's the pattern in the field in terms of the populations through time? So over the last decade, we've been able to collect uh, population data along the elevation gradient, and sure enough, you can guess which ones are the ones that are actually still declining, the susceptible ones, right? So that's a paper that we're working on right now, showing that some of these species are highly susceptible. And the non-susceptible species, some of them, like gladiator frogs, can carry really high level of, of infection. And we think those guys are the ones that may be causing problems with the remaining species. So they can produce high levels of BD, um, and they can hang out close to other frogs and cause problems. So. Um, so that's the story in South America, but you know that's only part of what's going on around the world in terms of this fungus. There's a big part of the world over here where BD, the habitat appears to be suitable for BD in Asia, um, and yet um, there's not a single case 
reported about declines caused, to, caused by uh, infections in, in Asia. Uh, and yet, here's a picture uh, just from um, about a week ago from my grad student who's in China. So um, he's starting to find uh, die-offs. Now, whether or not this is due to BD or some other thing, there are lots of things that could be causing these die-offs. But of course, we now have a predictive tool that we can use. We've swabbed these guys and the guys that survived to try to see, is BD there and how much of it is left? Um, a lot of my students now are doing retrospective surveys in different parts of the world to try to understand, you know, is it not a problem in Asia because it hasn't, it's not there? Or is it not a problem in Asia because it's been there for a long time? And um, uh, Gabi, who's now working in Jamie's lab, um, basically worked off of these papers that came out of Japan early on where they found the first outbreak in, in Asia was reported in 2006. Now, outbreak isn't really a good word to use here because these were animals in captivity. Okay, so it wasn't in the wild, they were in captivity. But nevertheless, they found BD in some giant uh, salamanders in, in Japan. And that led to some studies, um, in particular, um, uh, a following study that basically said, look, we need to figure out what's going on with BD in Asia. And um, what my, one of the uh, papers suggested was that maybe BD emerged in Japan because they found a couple of old, old positives in Japan. Uh, my student then went through museum collections from the 1890s to the 1990s. Um, many of them were from here in the, in the MBZ. And you can see here her results um, across these different islands, across all those decades. She, she got three positives, okay, up to 1993, which is not very many. Um, and we believe that our technique is working. Um, if you look across Asia, there have been studies in at least 18 countries now, probably a couple more. Um, many of them are showing that it's either not there or it's there at super, super low prevalence. I got interested in this because I, I started working with Rafe Brown, who is a postdoc here and now is at the University of Kansas, and he's been working in the Philippines for a very long time. And I convinced him to collect swabs in the Philippines, just like I've convinced many of you to collect swabs <laughs> in different parts of the world. And the Philippines turned out to be really interesting because if you looked at um, all the different sites that Rafe had been going to, which is extensive, um, most of the sites came out negative, and these are just showing you sample sizes, so the bigger the circle, the more samples. Um, but some of the sites uh, came out with a, quite a lot of positives, so this is in 2011. If, and this is just prevalence of those samples, okay, so high prevalence of that one site. And then the other thing that was really interesting is that the infection intensity, which is what we're trying to show you here, um, the, the big circle here shows an infection intensity of around 300 on average zoospores. The threshold is around 10,000, but it's a really rough threshold. So we thought, okay, well let's predict that something's going on at this little site right here, close to Manila. It's called Mount Palai Palai. It's a national park. Um, and if you look at the different sites that were positive in the Philippines, here's, the, here's what the data looked like in 2011. Here's that threshold. Okay, so um, we're saying something's up there. We wrote a grant through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and they gave it to us to go back out there. They fund stuff in other countries, which is amazing. If you look at all the different species, you can see that um, most of the high positives, anyway, are from one species, Rana similis, which is a threatened species in um, the Philippines. This is the data from 2012. You can see I'm really good at making graphs, so I just, I just added these things on here about where the data should be. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, got to work on that. Um, so this is, uh, they were around 300,000 zoospores. The point is they're above this mortality threshold at that one site, Mount Palai Palai. And it's really different from these other sites. So we predicted something might be going on there. We went back there, and sure enough, in 2012, boom, they're really high. And of course, most of the high were from one species, Rana similis, the same one we'd identified as being a problem in the past. And if you talk to the Philippine uh, uh, herpetologists that have been working in these areas for a long time. Mount Palai Palai happens to be a place where um, they take a lot of biologists to go check out because they've been going there for a long time. It's really easy to get to and there's lots of different species of frogs there. So um, we believe this is our first outbreak in Asia. We did some very simple um, uh, comparisons of these really high um, intensity uh, swabs and found that it looked like the BD strain that we found in that site matched genetically the BD strain that we have here in California. 
And so what did we do next? We, there's not much population data, but it turns out we went back this summer, can't find Ronosimilis there, talked to a bunch of biologists, they're like, oh yeah, they've been declining there for years. Um, what about the other species? Well, no, they're fine. They're still around. So what did we do? We did a susceptibility trial this summer in the same place, and uh, the data are still being analyzed, but of the uh, eight species that we tried working on, Ronosimilis was the only one where all the animals died within about four weeks. So in the Philippines, we took, we rented a place and did susceptibility trials right there where we had, we exposed animals to BD and looked at what happened. Most of them got infected in the first, we've only analyzed the first three weeks of the BD data, and most, all of them got infected that were supposed to get infected. By the third week, most of them were already losing the infection. But here's the interesting thing. With, with, with the fact, and so it matches the fact that like the species that's declining was the one that died off. The infections were highest in those. We haven't analyzed all the data, but it's looking pretty interesting. But what's really cool is that some of these species um, in the Philippines are ones that you can buy in the pet trade. So um, before Raul and Jason went to the Philippines, Raul went to Petco in San Francisco and purchased a whole bunch of these frogs that occur all over Asia. So this is getting back to how did BD get to where it is. And he did some susceptibility trials at SF State. And um, some of the species, we didn't have, these guys are really expensive, by the way. <laughs> these are really cool. They're like $50 each, they're really expensive. But you know, we're working on some funding to get some more. Um, some of them are just not susceptible uh, from the pet trade, okay? We, th we don't know exactly where in Asia they're from, but they're Asian species. Others are dying, like, very quickly. Um, like these guys right here, Polypetides leucomastics, are dying very, very quickly. Hylorana is another one, uh, Erythraea, I can't pronounce it very well. Um, so some of these species were in the infection trials that we did. Notice there's no Ronosimilis here. You can't get them in the petrate, it's probably a good thing. Um, and if you look at Hylorana, Erythraea, sorry, these are survivals of animals through time with the sample sizes. Um, if you look at the data for these guys, all of these guys, but I'm gonna show you one example. Um, I'm just beating it over the head here at this point, but you can see that if you look at the infection intensities of each individual frog through time, the ones that died, the five that died, were ones that are crossing this red line up here. These other guys that survived are down here. Some of them are getting pretty close. There's the um, survival through time. So it looks like you know prediction is working. It's actually meaning something. We went back and did a retrospective study of the Philippines, 1,200 samples. All negatives until 1996 was the first positive breed out there. So we think we have a new, uh, you know, an emergence of this BD in the Philippines. Um, now, my title was something to do with the microbiome. I haven't really talked about that. But of course, the big question is, why is that species that's dying when you buy it in the pet trade, um, dying here in the lab, not dying when we infect them in the field? when we infect them in a lab in the Philippines. Okay, we collect them in the field, bring them in, infect them. They're not dying in the Philippines. So one idea is that the microbiome on the, on the frog itself may be protected. So, um, and that of course is looking at this interaction between the host amphibian, its symbionts that are providing uh, some sort of protection against this pathogen. Um, and that interaction, that three-way interaction between these different types of species. Um, there are, there's a growing uh, body of evidence showing that the microbiome on the amphibian may be really important in, in the outcome of this infection. And so what my lab is doing now is we're starting to use um, next-gen uh, sequencing techniques to try to characterize, first of all, what are the bacterial assemblages, and we're finding that there are thousands, I'm sure you're not surprised, but thousands of different species of bacteria on these. And that it tends to be from species to species to species, you get differences. But within species, you get a lot of generalities. You get the same microbiome, generally speaking. Now, we're, we're still working on this because computation this is, it takes a lot of work to do. But my hypothesis is that those animals that are not dying in the Philippines, but are dying in the pet trade, are dying, we're getting that difference because they have differences in their microbiomes. If you bring frogs into the lab or a pet trade and you keep them around for a long time, most of the bacteria that live on them naturally die off. 
Um, and so uh, that's our next sort of step, is to try to figure out how are these things involved in the survival of these guys through time. Um, now, I'm not going to, I had done, I had shown this to uh, the Department of Integrated Biology here last year, where I, where I showed that the skin microbes are actually important in preventing the decline of at least one species, the susceptible species here in California, Rana sieri and Rana muscosa. Um, and that if you add the, some beneficial bacteria that you can grow, you can get differential outcome. You can get survival of a, of a susceptible species, even after you infect them with the fungus. Okay, so it looks like it is um, some a, a possibility of what we can do to try to change things, outcomes in the wild. And this is um, a place in uh, King's Canyon National Park where we actually, you know, changed or tried to mess with the biome, the microbiome of these frogs. We added some of the good bacteria to see what would happen with them in the future. And we did it right as a disease outbreak was occurring. And we're able to show that animals that got the good bacteria had a higher survival rate. And that's what um, and that's what these data show. These are animals down here that did not get the good bacteria. These are animals that did get the good bacteria. They got highly infected. They didn't actually cross that lethal zone around four, 10,000 or 10 to the four. Um, and we, at least from one year to the next, we got survival. <coughs> Of these of these uh, individuals, uh, the control frogs didn't even make it through the first summer. This is data from 2010 to 2011. So um, I know I've been talking for a long time, so I want to give you guys at least a few minutes to um, ask questions. So I think we have like five minutes now before we have to go. So I wanted to just end here and thank all these people. These projects have been funded by NSF. Uh, and one last thing, we are actually now working with the San Francisco Zoo and the Oakland Zoo. They're helping us raise yellow-legged frogs that we are then going to reintroduce back into these empty habitats with the knowledge that we think we can change the outcome, uh, or at least we can affect the disease, the pathogen host dynamics of these frogs in a way that leads to persistence. Time will tell, uh, but at least we have gotten initial funding from the Oakland Zoo and from the San Francisco Zoo to move forward on this. And we got uh, some money from uh, the Forest Service near Lake Tahoe to actually do some of these translocations where we move animals from one population to empty populations, but also bring some into these zoos so that we raise up more individuals and have higher sample sizes. So they're going to be raising not only captively bred animals, but also doing what's called head sturdy. And as we move these guys into the field, we're going to be working on the, the microbiome. Uh, this student right here, Silas Ellison, has, uh, is doing a longitudinal study near Lake um, Lake Tahoe on Rana Sieri that have survived an outbreak, and he's going to—he's <coughs> capturing the same individuals through time with, that have microchipped mm -hmm. and getting microbiome samples throughout the summer, so we can say, okay, well, you know, we have all these microbiome samples that we're quickly collecting, but you know, how does it actually change on an individual through time in a place that's surviving with PD, or, or does it not change? And then that will give us the basis to sort of the basic biology question behind, you know, how important is the microbiome? And why does it work in some situations and appear, apparently not in others? So with that, I'll stop and give you guys a few moments for questions. Yes? Um, what possible unintended consequences might there be to introducing uh, an apparently beneficial bacterium into an environment that doesn't have that bacteria. Yeah. So that's a really good bioethical question. And so far, I've totally avoided <coughs> that. By, uh, when we uh, altered the bacteria, the bacterial populations on those frogs, we actually cultured it from that population. So even the populations that are highly susceptible, where BD hasn't arrived yet, a few of the individuals have the right kind of bacteria. But, um, and it's like we cultured it off of 40 frogs and we got one culture to work. So, um, but then if you go to a place like Yosemite where the frogs are in the endemic state with the, with the pathogen, about 80% of the frogs were able to culture bacteria from about that kind of bacteria from about 80% of the frogs. So it goes from less than 10% to about 80%. And, and that's just the culturable kind. Now that what we need to do is look at the microbiome where we can actually um, use next-gen techniques to actually look at the whole uh, community of bacteria and fungi, for that matter, on these different populations. So we're sidestepping that issue for now. 
That's how did you select the bacterium? Why that one? Um, we selected that one because somebody else, Reed Harris, had shown that in hemidactylium salamanders, that guard eggs, if you took the females away from the eggs, the eggs would die not from egg predators but from a fungal infection. And he found this one species of bacteria that kills, that basically the adults were spreading onto the eggs. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw him give that talk, I thought maybe that's what the difference is in the Sierra Nevada between surviving and non-surviving populations. And sure enough, we found the same species of bacteria. But now um, there are a couple people working on the phylogeny of that bacteria. Like, are they really the same species or, or what? Um, but so basically what we do is we culture the live bacteria, and then in the lab we test it just on a petri dish against uh, the fungal pathogen to see what happens. And it turns out that um, you know, there's a bunch of people doing this now. Uh, and uh, you got, uh, Jonah, you guys just published a paper on that, on uh, Rana uh, Cascadia, right? Yeah, but we didn't find that species. You didn't find that species, but you found <laughs> okay. other species that were, um, that were able to uh, kill. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think it's a single species issue. It's more of, there, that just happened to be the one that's easy to culture. And uh, anyone, even I can culture it and identify it because it's purple. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know what it does to the fungus? Yeah. Yes, um, luckily the pharmaceutical industry is way ahead of us on this. They produce, uh, they, they already have the genes uh, identified that produce uh, a number, a suite of um, antifungal compounds that basically uh, uh, prevent um, the cell walls from forming in the fungi. So I don't know if it's not called cell wall, but the, something like that. Yeah. So that's, kind of, that's actually pretty well known, and they're starting the, to do um, trials to basically use some of those compounds to treat. Uh, human infections of fungi. Because it works against all fungi, not just the species. Yeah. So, you mentioned this, but if you go back to the endemic frogs and endemic populations now, you know, Sam McConnell and so on, yeah. and <coughs> treat the frogs to remove or diminish the microbial community on those frogs. We have not done that. Do they then die when you infect them? We have not done that. So you're talking about using antibacterials, yeah. something like that. Yeah. So that you know that's a great idea, and I've been pushing that for years. But it turns out when you actually talk to the microbiologists, the antibacterials don't actually. It's not like a blanket antibacterial, and it actually it works on some bacteria, not on others. Nobody's tried that experiment. I'd love to try it, but we just have not. Yeah. Because actually, you've got your four five four sequencing or whatever for it. Microbiomes, you can actually do that simultaneously. Well, that's, and that's see what's going on. Exactly. Now that you can actually see what's going on yeah. with the microbial communities and not worry about, you know, culturing. Mm -hmm. You can just actually yeah. look at it directly. Exactly. That's, uh, that's okay. Do it. Yeah. Come on. What are you doing there? <laughs> 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 James, do you have a question? I thought I said you raised your hand. Well, I was going to ask something else. I, there was an article in uh, our news and views in Science or Nature in the last couple of weeks about a new chytrid that's on the article of the, uh, salamanders in Europe that's yes. now spreading and so forth. So I mean, how many how many chytrids are there out there? And are there other? I mean, is your assay just picking up one? Are there all, well, there are only two that are known, but I mean, the only two that are known. <laughs> you know, yeah, so this is a this is a, um, a different species of Batraco chytrid. Yeah. Um, BS. <laughs> but, I mean, that suggests that there's more than you know, it's a bigger two, picture. and so yeah. and a more complex yeah. picture, and that maybe some other chytrid, you know, could be involved in even your animals Absolutely. without you guys knowing. Absolutely. It. So, for example, these these um, these two separate instances that I've been talking about for die-offs in Asia, one in Yunnan and one in the Philippines, you know, it could be that it's not the Pacheco Catrium that we've been working with. It could be some other some other form. We had we had a um, a couple of my students found a bunch of dead uh, Ambysma macrodactylum up in the uh, Trinity Alps, mm -hmm. and we tested them for BD last year, and they were negative for BD. Yeah. Um, and at the time, the BS paper hadn't come out <coughs> in, in uh, PNAS. So um, you know, I totally agree with you. It could, there's a there's probably a much more complex picture, but right now. Because we're in this sort of crisis mode, my lab, what we've been doing is just, we've got something that works, let's check everything we can, including retrospectively in these different parts of the world to see if based on just that one assay, do we get a picture that makes sense? In some cases it does. In the salamander picture here in the Cascades, it did. Now we're trying to get, they're, they're creating the simi a similar assay now for that different species of uh, the trichotrium that was found on salamanders in Europe. And we're going to try that. Luckily, everybody's relatively nice and cool, and they're sharing all this information with us. 
So we're going to go back and test those now, see if it's there. And in fact, we're going to, since we can do it, we can actually do, we can test for both BS and BD in the same sample again because the technology allows for that. So that's, that's going to be the next thing, I think, is that we can find. Yes, Dan. So the situation in Africa is kind of odd in a way. So most of sub-Saharan Africa is completely covered in chitrate, but it seems to be completely absent from West Africa. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment on, on that, but I also have a, a second part of this. Um, the assemblage of species that are found you know, in West Africa and adjacent areas like Cameroon and even Nigeria are largely the same. And so it's a situation where you might actually have an opportunity to take closely related or even the same species in a place where the strain is endemic in a place where there's never been a strain and do some kind of comparison there as well. I think that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, um, we should collaborate some more. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. So one of the one of the things that's pretty interesting in, in Africa is that there was a paper that came out in 2006 or seven that had done a big survey throughout Kenya, and they found BD all over the place, and they didn't see any frogs dying. And there had been a paper that said it was found in 1937. It must have come from Africa, um, and their conclusion was, fine, uh, everything's probably fine in Africa, in Kenya anyway. It's just all over the place. It's not causing problems. But then when you look at the paper, there's no, um, you know, they only went to each site once. And there's no population data for any of these places. And if you look at the infection intensities on those animals, there's a couple of places that have super high infection intensities. So working with Dave Blackburn at the at Cal Academy and several other people, we've done a retrospective study. I just couldn't fit it into the slides today. A retrospective study in, um, in, different, in several different, about eight different countries in Africa. And guess what we're finding? The same thing, where it's actually emerging very recently. At least the BD strain that we're able to detect emerged very recently. It emerged in, the, in 19, about 1998. And in some cases, in Cameroon, for example, where you guys were sampling, I mean, some of the infection rates were you know, sky high. The prevalences were very, very high. Um, so uh, I think you know, there could be an issue where it, there's a strain that came from Africa, and it's there at an endemic sort of situation. But then there could be a situation where another strain gets brought on top of that one and is causing new outbreaks. We're, we're not sure. But I think what we need to do is sort of pair together um, you know, these retrospective views with what's happening today. But then we need revisits at those sites so we can get a dynamic picture of what's happening with those pathogens, with the pathogen host interaction. And if it's increasing both in prevalence and intensity, I would say those are the places we need to go look. And on top of that, we need to do susceptibility trials in those guys. We just completed a susceptibility trial of, I think, five different species of Xenopus that vary in their ploidy level from octopodoploids or something like 12 copies, whatever that is, and uh, down to two copies. Um, and it's really interesting. Anything that has um, uh, Xenopus lavis style stuff in it, or very close to that, is, gets infected and nothing happens. But if you look at like Xenopus tropicalis, for example, they die very, very quickly. And they also have, I believe, lower ploidy levels. <coughs> they, they have, have a different strain of BD? Or? No, no. So we infected them with a known strain. Um, and we found across the Xenopus groups of species that we, that we got, um, I, should, I should have looked at those notes earlier, but um, we found a really big difference in susceptibility just across those guys. So I think the next step to do is to go, okay, well, that's with this deadly California strain of BD, but what happens if we start looking at these species in their own context, you know, in Africa, and we use a strain from Africa, then what happens? Is that going to give us a different picture of that? So clarifying that observation, was ploidy level correlated with resistance? Um, it was, but not, um, we didn't have enough uh, replicate species to really say, the reason we did that is that um, there have been, a, uh, there's a couple papers that have come out that have said that, that have proposed that, that basically said, um, you know, if you have a more um, generous genome, you should have more copies of, of genes that could be involved with uh, immun immunosuppression, for example, of invasive species or, or of uh, pathogens. And, um, and it, it sort, of, sort of looks that way, it's not, it's not definitive. <coughs> 
Yeah, it's coming back to the bullfrogs. Yes. With all the retrospectives I've talked about in California, you didn't mention if you've done any work on the bullfrog, the introduced bullfrogs. So the, we have a paper in uh, submission right now, um, and we've gone through bullfrog collections here and at the yeah. Cal Academy. Turns out people didn't collect very many bullfrogs. <laughs> <laughs> so of the few that we have collected, though, we're, so here's the interesting thing: we're getting we got positives um, in California in 1912, um, American bullfrogs. Now, you know it's hard. It, it could be like if you look at disease theory, um, and, you, and, you're, and you're looking at the the sort of arrival and invasion of new pathogens or pathogens into naive populations of hosts, it does, it's not like, you know, most cases you get, you know, multiple invasions before you get, you know, actual increase in prevalence or, or epizootic events. So it could be that that's what was going on, um, or it could be that we're picking up a different strain. But we've been through those samples over and over again, and we keep getting positives. We do histology on them. And we cannot find BD. We can find hyperkeratosis, which is looks like BD, but the world's expert that described BD just can't find it on those things. So, from, from, from your PCR assay, do you get are you trying to get sequence data to look at the phylogeny of BD in these historic samples? Well, it's a double-edged sword. We, we can get some sequence data, but the reason that it works so well, we think, is that we're using very small pieces. So it's like 142 base pairs, something like that. And it's also ITS region, which um, individual cells tend to have lots of copies. So it's actually not very good for phylogenetic studies. I mean, the phylogeny would really help untangle yeah, routes of well, dispersal. Didn't, didn't Bree have uh, in that paper that she wrote? So Bree, so Bree, yeah, I mean, um, I was hoping she'd be here today. She's, yeah, she is the person that's really, really useful and, and coming across with some really great new papers that, have, that are showing that that can give us a really good picture of what's going on. Um, the problem is on these museum collections, up until recently, we just the, the, the number of copies are not high enough to actually look at larger pieces of DNA. But we're getting there. Um, Kelly's Mudio and Bree working together have been using this magnetic technique where you can sort of increase your probability of uh, getting, getting more DNA out of these, um, out of these older samples. Um, the problem, if you look at so, um, so this, one of the samples that I, that I had Bree and, and Kelly look at from the Philippines was an animal that was highly infected, so 300,000 zoospores. From that, just from that swab, they were able to get enough DNA to do um, a phylogenetic analysis that basically said, yes, you've got the California one at that place. But for the ones that I really want to find out on, for example, the 1912 uh, swab of a frog here in California, um, there's not, the, the zoospore equivalence is like 0 0.001, so like, you know, many orders of magnitude less. So we're dealing with very small amounts of DNA. And, you know, I think we're getting closer to having the technology to do that. And when we do, that's going to be the way to look at this question. Like, what are these lineages that are showing up? I think we've got to stop now. Go on forever. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, Vance. We're very yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, 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 It's not a high elevation species, obviously. For example, I'm at 400 meters, and so if it was a high elevation site, then you would. Oh, yeah, well, I was going to leave that out there and from the top of the mountains. Well, yeah, but it turns out they've been. So it took us almost three months to get to 15 months. Yeah, probably.
Yeah. So, yeah. so, so from that site, which we can get with all yeah. Well, I had that with all these other sites. Yeah, I know that. Extremely common. Uh huh. Basically, everybody gets it if you're there. So, who was helping you? Fortunately, we get the less virile. Yeah. So, yeah. But now there are new. His son. There are some new fungi. That means that there are no more diseases. Exactly. For real, the if you haven't read it, it's best book. David Cobain. And did a book on his own notes. And I think there's a couple of And he's a really good writer. Uh, 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 I mean, we thought I could say that. Uh, he doesn't Homemade. usually, uh, well, you know, maybe he does. Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, like, usually you have some good So, you know, when I was there, it was all the dirty days for me. The same so I used the logo. Yeah. Yeah. They often yeah. use slingshots yeah. for things. And he talks about yeah. the yeah. logo. Yeah. 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 I don't know if he ever picked up samples. He'd be awesome on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's good to meet you. Good to meet you, too. Exactly. Well, it's now. Yeah. But I still don't know. I don't know what's going on with me. How are you? Good. That was fun, huh? But that, so what I'm trying to do... So you've already screened yeah, all my Sue Luisi samples, like that Ted Townsend was... Oh, yeah. Probably the wrong word. Yeah, and I don't remember. I think I can get them for you. Oh, if I can get on that. Yeah. I'd be just curious to know if any of our positive. I think I remember there being something like what you see with these other things, like every, a few here and there. There's a few here and there, and they're really low positive. So yeah. what there I think is going on is that we have multiple streams that have come to the store. And in a few places, we have these variables that we have come in. But you know, they come in, don't do anything, they come in, don't do anything. We, we and then did when I arrived at the Smithsonian, in fact, the first one all the frogs are you know, gathered together. And then you issue. get this ramping up. And one of my papers was I have a grant that the yeah. NSF right now so that we propose that there are su certain species that are super shedders <laughs> that amplify really the infections in certain areas, like it's gladiator really frogs. Really yeah. If you look at where most of the amphibians decline in the Andes, they're right in the range of the gladiator frogs. And the gladiator frogs are like a they can handle you really know, high levels, overnight. and they can still so, die, but, they, yeah, but they're really common. Like they're all infected. Wow. So, like that's, that's, that's our idea. That's our, that's our yeah, plan. Well, Have you ever thought about swabbing humans? Yeah. I have, mm -hmm. uh, I, and I have swabbed humans. I mean, do you think it's possible that, like, for some of these things, it does take multiple, multiple interactions, and then yeah. occasionally they stick, and then you have your problem, and then you've got these herpetologists just going around yeah. doing yeah. things? Yeah. 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 Ye
so, so powerful. But there is, you know, there is that PNAS story of the um, crustaceans that have been affected. And right. In fact, if you look in these streams in the Philippines, there, there are tons of crustaceans. In there. So it, yeah, and, but it, and it doesn't occur externally in the crustaceans; it occurs in their gut. So that uh, there must be people working on that now. Like there must be people seeing if they get well, transmission. I don't know. Uh, Jason Rohrer was working on it for a while, but I'm not sure where he's doing it anymore. I mean, what we need to do is have a coordinated international effort to basically do the same types of experiments, like susceptibility experiments, right. in different parts of the world. But I, you know, I talked to NSF about it, and there's only one way to do that, and that's with these uh, macro system grants. Yeah. And they're impossible. Yeah. I mean, you have yeah, to be. Just... I mean, you have to be a certain level to get on. That's like he's got one to do. I think, I think you can get one. You can. You think so? Yeah. Oh, I think, I think so too. Yeah. yeah. Because it's, I mean, that's the only way to do it. Because you can get like RCN grants, uh, but they're not re research collaborative networks. But no. they don't fund research. No, no, I know. But, but I think you could get it because uh, uh, you, you make a case that the, the chytra is a model for infectious disease ecology, yeah. especially fungi. And you know, they keep you, you, you underemphasize that there are, there are a huge number of human. Fungus now. And I'm not some, going to some still newly discovered. That's and, true. And, yeah. they're, they're, and some of them are really potent and they cannot be cured. They can't be cured you have to essentially kill the patient to get rid of the mm. fungus. It's, well, they're, 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 they're sexual diploids. You know? they're, they're much harder to get rid yeah. to deal with them. That's true. And, and, and they evolve very slowly, so they're not going to evolve. They're not going to evolve to, to become benign organisms. If it's a model for a human system, maybe there's an analogous program in the NIH that would fund this. I, you know, I've shopped around. It looks pretty. Have you tried any? Yeah, you, can't get, you can't get NIH money for this. Uh, I tr I've talked to NIH people. And they, I mean, That's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> what about? No, they're I, like, I guess they told, like, bunch of frogs. Who cares? They, they basically said it's not a human disease. Go to NSF. And NSF, I mean, we got to. Uh, you know, five-year NSF grants through the Ecology of Infectious Disease Panel. We got two of them to study BD, and we did. You know, we published a bunch of papers, mm -hmm. and it's really great. But the program officer basically told me, "Don't even try." See, see that's that's the trouble with them because they want to go on to the next news. Always thing. wants new things. They will yeah. not. Uh, yeah, they don't NSF want to will specifically yeah. not do ongoing, continuing projects. Yeah. And he, he he drew a graph <laughs> for me of how discovery works in science. This is Sam Scheiner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he basically said, look, BD was here for a long time in this growing part of discovery. Now it's asymptoted out. We're not interested in funding. Yeah. Hmm. This is like, oh. See, see, that's when it should turn to NIH. That's when yeah. it should build to NIH. But yeah. it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's a, a fundamental flaw in the system somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Have you tried any, any big pharmaceutical so firms? The Canadian system is much better. We, got, than we, got, big, we just big, got a grant from the Disney Corporation. But what about some of the big pharmaceutical companies? I mean, how do you do Disney that? cares, but NIH does as well. Well, <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they care because they can patent so, uh, How do we turn you know, this thing off? You know? Protect oh, yeah, you something that works, get. they can patent it and make big bucks. Yeah. Like these huge so international firms so like Bayer. Uh -huh. you hit it? Roche, what's the well, one? You know, First time you have to go across across the bat, let it be hit again. I just thought I need to Yeah, no, I don't know, but I just think you. that, yeah. you know, industry, if they can make money. Thanks very much, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's awesome. Guys, if they you can know, make a billion, maybe the way to do this is to start a Disney film. That great talk as usual. I mean, you know, animated. Thanks a lot. I think he's. So, Chuck, I'm so sorry. I don't want to get your emails. What were they about? Well, you know, because of your talks and everything, I've been thinking about uh, what could be done in the way of publishing a book on this. Um, um, and I uh, remember talking to you about this yeah. like um, nine months ago. Or Let's sit instead of stand. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so the so the the idea that I've well, let me tell you a little bit of what my new job is. Okay. Are I'm, you still with UC Press? No, oh, okay. I'm now with uh, uh, CRC Press of Taylor and Francis. Taylor and Francis own Super C, and they also own Garland Science. And Garland Science is the one people that do the molecular biology of the cell, the big Alfred's textbook. Yeah. yeah. So we're the we're the research arm of Taylor and Francis book publishing. Hmm. Okay. So I've been brought on board to do evolutionary biology, cell, molecular, and developmental biology. Okay. Okay. And included in that list of areas is microbiology. 
And it occurs to me that um, a good synthetic work bringing together all of the bits and pieces that deal with chytrid fungus concerns, yeah. ecology, evolution, microbiology, epidemiology, you know, you could put together a fairly obvious, I would think, and important um, outline yeah. for a book that could deal with the subject. And it could either be edited or authored. Um, you've got a lot of the work, the basic work that would need to go into the book. Yeah. I don't think it needs to be up to the second in terms of being well, you it's know, impossible, yeah. you know, because I mean, because things are moving too fast. It's like 320 papers a year on yeah. this stuff. I mean, yeah. it's just amazing. It's but there's not anything that it can, is considered the foundational work that brings together the people and the ideas in a way that would be um, something really good. And I go now to the American Society of Microbiology meetings, mm -hmm. and uh, that would be a great venue for that work. It would be, yeah. Um, and I'd like for you to consider whether or not it's something you could think about doing. Uh, give you plenty of time to do it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, we let you be free to organize it in any way you s would like. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and there's no cost to you associated with, you don't have to come up with a subsidy or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I would sort of uh, uh, make sure you understand is that this is intended to be a research publication intended for other researchers and, and, and uh, you know, graduate students and, mm -hmm. and, you know, NGO people. It's not intended to be for the general audience or for a... Okay, well, that make it easier to write, actually. Yeah, no, no. Because, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, the general audience, yeah. I mean, those, you've got to be a different kind of writer to know. Well, but in the result of that, of keeping that in mind, is that it's not going to be a cheap book. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be a book that people are going to have to spend money to buy, but will be a book that hopefully will be worth the money. Mm -hmm. So do you have, what's like an example book, um, just like, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, examples for, for this type of book, like, you know, that fit in this research realm? Well, you know, the, a book that, that I've always thought of as a great book that had a huge impact um, it's a it's a herpetological subject area, but it's also relatively research oriented. Mm -hmm. Is Mike Ryan's Tungara Frog book? Oh, okay. Sole yeah. author. Yeah. Uh, but that's if that's not the way you want to go, I yeah. can completely understand that. But the thing that I liked about that book is it took 